Um, let's start out actually by talking. Tell me about what your father thought of of working at Ford, and you have to say my father. Yeah. My father worked at Ford's, I guess would be about uh, 28, 1929, and 1930. Uh, he hated it. Uh, he thought it was a very oppressive uh, work environment. Uh, I don't think there's any great work environments in those days because he'd worked at Briggs and a few other places, Studebaker, uh, but he found uh, Ford's really oppressive. And it was basically because of the servicemen and how they treated people. And this despite the fact that my father didn't work on the line. He was an electrician, which is one of the, uh, the better jobs. Uh, but he got out of there as quickly as he could. In talking to your father, your memories of your father, was it, and you were a teenager at the time, you were a young yeah. man growing yeah. up. Was it your sense that, that workers had to give up something of themselves to work at Ford? Do you understand what I'm saying? Did you have to, what, would, what was the trade at Ford? Well, I, I think what you gave up is, uh, is dignity. Uh, that's what you gave up. Uh, I think any time you work in an oppressive environment, you give up some of yourself, some of your dignity, and some of your pride. And I think that's what you gave up. I think all Ford workers gave it up. They were compelled to give it up. And I suppose uh, any people that lived in a, in a totalitarian society uh, felt the same way. What compelled them to give it up? I mean, did they, was it well, there? because it was the only means of livelihood. I mean. You know, even before the union, auto wages were fairly attractive, and particularly Ford, of course, with their history. Uh, so, uh, relatively speaking, at least, uh, it was uh, their high wages and uh, provided for a good income for a family and a, and a decent level of uh, uh, and their, their standard of living. If you had to, again, thinking of it from the point of view of a young man, seeing this through your parents, if you had to articulate that as a, was there a trade involved, you know, this for that? Or am I, you know what I'm saying? You know, well, did you trade dignity for stability? Did yeah, well, that's what you did, uh, but, but you didn't do it voluntarily. Uh, you had this, uh, this trade-off, uh, which you gave up for some of your, your freedom and, uh, and your dignity in order to provide for what, in those days, was a pretty good living. And uh, again, I, I would liken it to uh, people, I suppose, uh, in a totalitarian society, because that's what it was. But then the advantage, of course, you had there vis-a-vis -vis the totalitarian society, when you walked out of the Rouge, you got your freedom back. Did you really? Oh, yeah. I, I think uh, uh, once you, you left the, uh, the factory, you were a free American uh, citizen. Now, one time that was not true at Ford, where they used to try to control um, the workers' behavior outside the workplace, which is part of an earlier history of the Ford Motor Company. And they gave up on that? They gave up on that. There's a great book called um, Five Dollar Day and yeah. Social Control. Have you read that? By yes, yes. And then they used to hire all the sociologists. I guess he was great in hiring sociologists and criminals and, uh, and uh, boxers. He's very, very, uh, very high on ex pugs. <laughs> employment for boxes. Yeah, well, it, it helped them to control the workforce. Um, as a kid, again, with your father working at Ford, and you're coming up through high school in Detroit, Henry Ford was, I mean, obviously was a household, well, it's a two-part question. Tell me if Henry Ford was a household word, and also, oh, yeah. what did that persona of Henry Ford represent to you, to an immigrant family? Well, in the, uh, I can recall, of course, like in 1930, I'd only be 14 years of age. Uh, but one thing that I always, always remember, and this is really before the Depression, obviously, and in our neighborhood, I know of no kid that I associated with where their parents were born in America. Nobody. It's an immigrant neighborhood. And uh, uh, Polish, a lot of Polish, and uh, some Italian, and he went to church on Sunday, great churchgoers, and he used to wear at, uh, at Ford, I don't know if anyone has told you, he had a little uh, sort of brass badge, about this big and this wide, and he used to wear it on a blue serge, serge suits on Sunday, or lapel, and they were proud of the fact that they worked for Ford. And uh, I, I'll, never, I'll never forget that. In church, they were? They were on the way to church, on their Sunday suit. They never put their suit on except on Sunday, 
They had blue serge suit on, they wear the badge. You're very proud of that. badges in the church? Well, I, I, one of my vivid memories were uh, people on Sundays. There is a Polish community, predominantly some Italians, all Catholic. And uh, when he went to church on Sunday, they'd have this little badge, a Ford badge on their lapel of all blue serge suits, you know, no, no other colors, just blue serge. And uh, so they, they were, in a way, proud uh, of working for Ford. And, uh, and I suppose when you think of it, probably, uh, as I say, all, all immigrants, uh, they, there's this, this aura about uh, wealthy and the powerful. Uh, but they should, soon became disenchanted. Instead of wearing that, that badge, they should have wore a purple heart. Excellent, excellent. Um, in the workplace at that time, Ford in particular, in the auto industry in general, the idea of power and powerlessness, where did, who called the shots, who decided? Things? Well, it, it, there were places not only for Ford was a bit more oppressive because of the private police force, the, the servicemen, uh, consisted of uh, paroled convicts, uh, a lot of boxers and ex-boxers, and uh, they were really the policemen. Uh, but other companies, for example, and, and General Motors, uh, employed the services of a private uh, detective agency, the Pinkerton Agency, infamous in American history. Uh, Chrysler employed the services of a corporation's auxiliary, another spy outfit. Uh, but the workplace of those days, and Ford I, it was maybe a bit more severe, but generally speaking, it's very oppressive. And you didn't have any dignity uh, because you couldn't question, you couldn't dissent, you couldn't grieve. Uh, anybody that protested uh, was uh, soon dismissed, uh, so you you didn't have this essential element of dignity. Your right to speak back, or your right to raise your voice when you're being mistreated. Do you want to talk a little bit? And I'm sure your dad must have mentioned this about literally not being able to use your voice at Ford, about the Ford silence, the rules against talking. Do you remember? Yeah. The, Can I ask you actually? It's yeah. important to think at this point. If you did hear about it from your dad, to say, my, I heard my father talk about it, okay? Make sense? Yeah, I heard my father uh, talk about the absolute oppression uh, at Ford, and he made up his mind to get out of there as soon as he could, could find another job. And even saying that, of course, he, he was an electrician, and he had a bit more freedom. You had to talk in the course of your work much more so than an individual on assembly line. An individual on assembly line just said nothing. You just did your work over and over and over, about 60 an hour. Uh, he had a bit more freedom, but even with that additional freedom and flexibility that went with a job, really, not with a system, uh, he found an extremely oppressive uh, place to work. And he used to come home, and, uh, uh, and I can recall it so vividly, because he's a proud man, and he come from a tradition in, in Scotland where people were used to speaking their mind and speaking up, and he always did, uh, but he couldn't at Rouge. And it was sad. Um, I'll come back to Ford and Rouge in a minute. How did you, this, I'm going to change the subject here, how did you um, hear about, how did you know that in 1929 a crash had happened? Well, you didn't know it uh, immediately. I'd be 13 then, and uh, you really didn't feel it until your father lost his job and you couldn't pay the rent. And then uh, you have a traumatic experience, like getting evicted from your house. Uh, that will g give you the message clearly. And that happens to so many people, including our family. The fact of the matter is uh, we lived in an upper flat, and then we moved to a single house, and that was the house from which we were evicted. And we didn't know what to do. My father went and talked to the old landlord, and he was glad to get my father back, our family back, just to occupy the house because by this time people were taking the banisters away for firewood. And, and so we lived uh, the remaining years of depression without paying any rent, of course, with a promise to pay it back, which, what my, of course, my father did, and it's $15, $20 a month. And uh, so you have these uh, memories. I, uh, 
I have a recollection of uh, getting coal from welfare and uh, we carried it in by a bushel basket and put it in the basement. Uh, I have uh, a recollection and I guess my mother wanted to save my father from the pain so he didn't go with us. I remember to get me a sweater uh, for the winter time. Uh, I recall the story I tell where I used to go is a place, Tasty Bread, about half a mile away from the house. And I used to walk there and get three day old bread. And he used to slice, slice the wrapper so you couldn't resell it. I think you got it for two cents. And my ma, we grew a few onions in the yard. My ma would make and mix up the onion and, uh, and, the, and the bread. It, it's like stuffing, it has some similarity to stuffing. And I, I can recall that after the depression was over, I said to my mom, I said, well, why don't you make some of that stuffing and onions and fry it the way you used to? That was good, and she did, and it was lousy. <laughs> it shows you that when you're, when you're a little hungry, nearly anything tastes good. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting we're, we were, never went to the point where we were starving or anything, but uh, our, uh, our diet was pretty meager. Tell me about the potatoes. Well, uh... One second. Roll out. Start out here. Start out with, as you did uh, Saturday and I was in bed. Uh, I can recall uh, the morning we were notified that we were going to be evicted. Uh, I was still in bed. And uh, the first thing that attracted my attention, my mother was crying. And I started listening and uh, became apparent that the landlord was there and was regretting how much he had to do it, but he had to get people, he had a prospect to uh, rent the house and uh, we couldn't pay the rent. And so we had to, had to leave and uh, fortunately went back to the place, the flat where we used to live and talked to the landlord and it was a sort of mutual accommodation. He wanted us in there to occupy the house and we of course didn't have any other place to go. I don't mean to beat a dead horse here, but do you remember the furniture being taken out? And the no, we, we, moved, we moved before, before the uh, bailiffs uh, came. Tell me about being involved in reverse. To, well, I, I have to start with this. That you, you, I like what you said. You said it was my first my introduction to social action and incorporate that. Yeah, my, uh, my first uh, introduction to social action was helping people move the furniture back in a house uh, after they were evicted. And, and as I recall how the system worked when the sheriff put the furniture out there, the, the people who we hired to put the furniture out, it cost them about $2 a room. And once it was out on the sidewalk, uh, a large crowd would get the, uh, get the furniture and move it back in. And uh, that got landlords pretty discouraged uh, over time. Uh, but that was my first experience of, you know, doing something and feeling good about it, feeling that you're really helping the cause and uh, helping some people. Tell me about that. I mean, I've experienced that in my own life, that wonderful moment when you, you know, you just, you know, it's been, stones have been falling on you for months and all of a sudden you decide you're gonna do something and you see that maybe you can. You know the yeah. moment I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, it, 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 uh, you know, things were going so badly. Uh, there were very few victories. There were no victories, as a matter of fact, and, and it's a feeling of exaltation that finally you've won one. The poor people of the neighborhood won one, and you won one when you move, moved the furniture back in the house, and the people who were evicted, uh, were, they, they were so relieved, and uh, it was a moment that I, you know, I still remember it vividly. Great. I'm gonna change subjects again. Um, how did you, how did you hear about the Ford Hunger March? How did you get the news? I, I really don't have that. Really? You know, that was, uh, you know, hell, it'd be less than 10 years. I don't even know where in the, when, what year was that? 1932. 32, no, I they really, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I sort of have a recollection, but, but not vivid enough to talk about. You don't have a recollection, you no. have a recollection. Let's cut for one second. Mark four. Uh, how did they prepare, for, if you could use the word potatoes, how did they prepare potatoes in your country? Well, uh, you know, when you had uh, uh, very little food, you had to be a bit ingenious on how you prepare it, particularly if you're preparing the same food, like potatoes. And I don't know how many different combinations my mother had. And you know, and the English and the Scotch are really not gourmet cooks, in case you don't know it. 
And uh, but she uh, found uh, so many different ways to cook potatoes to at least make it a bit more appetizing, although you're, you're eating the same food. Um, was your father, in the early years of the Depression, say 29, 30, 31, was your, was your father politically active in trying to get, you know, trying to yeah. do something? Well, he's politically active. Sorry, I'm going to stop you. If you could say yeah, my, my father. My father was uh, always a political activist. Uh, first of all, when he came to this country, he was very anxious to become a citizen. He, he loved this country. He wanted to be a citizen as fast as he, uh, he could, as quickly as he could, and I think it was five years. And uh, I can recall the first time talking politics in the house because I got a little uh, trouble in school and I was very, very young. Uh, I had to be about 12 years old. And it was the, uh, the Hoover-Smith election. And uh, my father was uh, talking about Smith in the house, I guess, with other people. So I went to school, of course, and advocated the, uh, the election of, of Al Smith. And I remember it so well because the teacher came down on me so hard. You know, uh, how could I say things like that, almost like I was swearing. You know, I, and to this day, I don't quite understand it, except perhaps all the teachers were Republicans. Uh, but that was, that was my first experience in, in speaking up. I, I, I'm not too sure I knew why I was for Al Smith, probably because my father was. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, but in any case, and then after that, I can recall uh, the 32 election uh, when my dad was uh, for Norman Thomas. And then uh, after 32, when Roosevelt was elected, uh, like so many uh, socialists of those days, they became New Dealers. And uh, he remained a New Dealer, I guess, to the day he died. As a young man, what was your reaction to the election of Franklin Roosevelt? I, uh, I, I, you know, really followed it as closely as a young person of, of that age uh, uh, would. You know, I'd be, what, uh, I'd be uh, 16 or thereabouts. And, uh, uh, he had such a great appeal, you know, you listen to him over the radio, and, uh, and I was very excited about his election. Did you, speaking of radio, did you ever, um, it's a two-part question, did you ever see Henry Ford, or did you ever hear Henry Ford's voice? I saw Henry Ford once quite by accident, as, uh, uh driving down McGraw, and I noticed this odd-shaped car, I guess it must have been an experimental car, and I looked in there, and there was Henry Ford. Uh, never spoke to him. I can never, I cannot recall hearing his voice. I remember, you know, reading about the trial, the uh, uh, the trial, I guess the slander uh, suit, and uh, someone reaching the conclusion uh, that he was an ignoramus uh, because he knew so little uh, about so many things. He's obviously a, a mechanical genius. <coughs> and had considerable ability in that area. Uh, but other than that, uh, I think uh, he, he wasn't a very bright or broad man. That's playing it wildly. Yeah. Um, let's cut for one second. Mark five. Um, so as you looked around you in Detroit, could you tell a Ford worker? Was there, were they distinguishable? Well, you can always tell a, a Ford worker, if you're on a streetcar during the time of shift changes, and that could, you know, be five in the evening, two in the afternoon, they had many shifts at Ford, uh, many split shifts. <clears throat> they didn't have, <clears throat> excuse me, such a massive place, they didn't have uniform starting times for every, every department or every building. I'm going to have you start it again and simply say, if you were on the streetcar at shift change time. Uh, uh, oh, okay. okay. Uh, if you're on, uh, on the streetcar at shift, uh, change time, and it was many times. You could always pick up the Ford worker. I mean, they would just be absolute asleep uh, in the streetcar. You know, they weren't talking, they weren't reading, they were sleeping. And uh, they must have worked at a, an exhaustive, absolutely exhaustive pace because, you know, when you think back, these were young men. Uh, I would guess that there are very few that were into their 40s. They were all 20s and 30s. What happened to you when you got into your 40s? Right? Well, you just let out. It's what we, the unions, used to call you, you work at Ford's, and then they put you on the industrial scrap heap, which means you're turned out. fact of the matter is, in our neighborhood, one of the great tragedies, in a way, 
uh, the fathers were laid off. And then coming out of the Depression, uh, Ford wanted to hire uh, younger people. So uh, uh, the, the sons of the fathers who were laid off went to Ford. The way you got hired there, the chief of police in Dearborn, they owned the, uh, uh, the Ford Motor Company, owned them. If you paid him $50, you got a job at Ford's. And so then you wind up with a situation, this happened several times in, in our neighborhood, where the son uh, went to work for Ford and the father who'd worked there for years and was laid off, remained laid off. This may sound like a funny question. Are you a singer? Do you remember any songs from that period? We're asking everybody that. No. No? No. Some of all the songs I knew Scott songs in those days. Uh, <laughs> um, let's cut for a minute. You probably have six. Yeah, I, I saw Hoover on one occasion, <clears throat> came to Detroit, and I recall it was at the Northwestern Playground in Grand River. And there's a massive crowd. And that worried me uh, because I thought, can this man be that popular? Of course, I was adding to the problem by being out there myself. But evidently, people go out to see a president of the United States out of curiosity. And, uh, but I can recall it be because it worried me that so many people uh, were out there to see him. Do you remember, do you remember any of who? Hoover's positions or his messages that he was sending to people during the Depression were you too young? Oh, the, the most uh, famous or infamous one uh, when Hoover says prosperity is right around the corner. And that really became a joke. It's like uh, Bush saying there's no recession. There's a great similarity between the two statements. Um, let's cut. <clears throat> What is a moving assembly room? Well, unless uh, people have witnessed it or worked on it, there's, there's really not a, a full appreciation of how difficult working on an assembly line is. And you're in one position. Your, your workstation uh, might be about 12 feet, and you have to stay within that workstation. Otherwise, you get into the next individual's way. So you're doing things repetitively, usually about 60 an hour. And the difficulty with an assembly line job is that the job controls you rather than you controlling the job. In other jobs, you can sort of set your own pace. You work fast for a little while and then work moderately. Assembly line is one pace. There's not a thing you can do about it. And that's what makes, in my view, uh, that type of work so monotonous and uh, it's not very fulfilling. Uh, the early, late 20s, early 30s, particularly after the crash, America is kind of crumbling, falling apart. Radicalism. Well, there's a lot of radicalism around uh, Detroit in the, in the 30s. Uh, on the street that I live, Daniel Street, is a communist hall at the very next street, and used to have a lot of activities, hunger march to Washington, and activities like that. And uh, a lot of those people subsequently became active in the Union. I've often thought uh, that the radical movements wouldn't have had the support that they did generate uh, in the early 30s had there been an alternative, had there been a viable labor movement, had there been a CIO in particular. They'd have expended their energies in a movement like the CIO, but the CIO didn't exist. And so out of sheer desperation and looking for an alternative, uh, they moved into radical movements that they otherwise wouldn't have moved into. You want to just give me a List, of lit litany of various radical movements that you well, the, the biggest, uh, the, the most, uh, the radical movement that got the most attention and probably had the most membership was the, uh, the Communist uh, Party, the, the Stalinist. Uh, I think uh, without question there were other radical uh, movements around various shades of the socialism and uh, so different uh, types of socialist parties. Uh, but the one that, uh, that had the greatest membership, probably nationally, but I know certainly in Detroit, uh, was the uh, Stalinist, the communist movement. You just reminded me of another question. I will get you out of here. Okay. Um, not only did they not have labor unions then, but can you list me some of the other things that, you know, as Murphy's trying to keep Detroit alive, yeah. I'm thinking about things like Medicare. Script. 
Well, I'm talking about federal programs that we now take. Okay, let me, let me, yeah, my that's a good, that's gonna, a good question. My kids, they have no yeah. idea that there was, no, yeah. there was yeah. no social security. Can you just yeah. give us a list of what? Well, uh, when, uh, you know, there's no unemployment compensation until 1938. Uh, first time I was uh, unemployed, uh, there's no unemployment compensation. Uh, and a lot of people, uh, particularly conservatives, demean uh, the WPA. And they say, well, uh, all it was was lake re uh, raking leaves, and that wasn't productive and so forth. But I can tell you uh, from my own experience watching uh, fathers of, of my friends, when they got on WPA, they got some of their dignity back. They were working. Uh, and, uh, and some of the work was very, very constructive. They built, uh, you know, over the country, they built bridges, they built schools. But even if it wasn't that uh, constructive, the very fact that people uh, were able to work again for very, very modest wages, but the fact that they worked in only very few hours a week. Then the other social program I think was critical to the future of this country was the CCC. I'm going to actually, that happens in a time period that's after our. Okay, all right. Film, so I'm going to, um, here's one from left field. Um, did you ever listen to any of Joe Lewis's fights? A new one. Any of Joe Lewis's fights? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Tell me about, Tell me about listening to Joe Lewis's fights. Well, uh, I remember uh, the first time. Uh, well, first of all, I saw Joe Lewis fight in the Golden Gloves. Uh, and the Golden Gloves in those days, uh, and the Olympia Stadium, it tracked 13, 14, 15,000 people. And Joe Lewis started as a light heavyweight. In fact, I saw him lose his only fight as an amateur. But then I remember... Uh, when he was defeated by Schmeling. And uh, we were in a neighborhood, I remember the anger of, uh, of the blacks uh, when Joe Lewis uh, was defeated. It was really disappointment. And then, uh, unfortunately, some, I guess some whites thought they would sort of rub it in, you know, and ride through the neighborhoods, the black neighborhoods, and, and uh, in later years, they'd probably have been killed, but those it was, uh, but it was it was mean spirited. And then I remember so well because we're very and uh, I've forgotten the year of the of the return match, but I remember vividly that I was uh, in a car with about three of my friends, just riding around and listening to the radio, and uh, and Lewis knocking out Schmeling in the in the first round. I remember both of those fights. How'd you feel when he knocked him out? Oh, I thought that was great. But, but see, that, that, you know, that's sort of a, an important lesson in a way. See, the people forgot about their prejudice and their bigotry because now it was United States against Germany. It was like, you know, Jesse Owens winning the Olympics. And that's a, you know, if they could just forget their prejudice and their bigotry in other areas of our, of our life, we'd have a better world. Very true. Is there anything else that you'd like to add from that period, yeah. from 27 to... We'll say 32 mm -hmm. to cut for a second. I've